I have really high expectations. I, I give homework every day, including Fridays. And I, and I tell them, homework's not a punishment. You know, it's just a way for you to keep building your skills. And one of the things I say to them is like, you know, my, one of my personal goals is to have you more prepared for ninth grade than the average kid going in there. So I expect them to come into class prepared every day. Bring your A game. Just give me your best shot. From there, it's my job to try to get you the tools you need. That's all you need is that. Same thing with this. Okay? When students have repeatedly done poorly in math and they come to another math class, it's like that door closes. Their emotional connection is like, nope, I've always done poorly here. So one of the things I can do is kind of try to pry open that door. That's one of the struggles I have. And just give students a chance to, they don't know it's okay to make mistakes. And the fact it's good to make mistakes because we learn from them. It's much quicker when you're Focus, and when they're done, and you ask a question, we move on. Professional development is, is critical in, for me as a teacher because there's plenty of room that I have to grow, and I need the tools, I need to be exposed to the tools to grow. I had a bunch of different jobs from building houses to landscaping, and I got a temp job at a pharmaceutical company. And while I was working, I got called back to a career day at my elementary school. So I'm talking to a bunch of, I think they were like fourth graders. One kid asked a question, he's like, okay, so why does medicine taste so bad? Another kid raised his hand and he said, so we don't take too much of it. And like, to me, that was a very moving part of my life. Like, I'll never forget that time. You know, it's like one of those things where I kind of felt lifted off the ground a little bit. I'm like, all right, there's something really, powerful that happens in classrooms. So I started volunteering at the school and I went back to school and I got my degree and started substitute teaching and that was about 15 years ago. My most important thing I think you have to do if you're gonna observe anybody, no matter who it is, they have to respect you, they have to care what you think, and then they have to trust you because it's a very delicate situation to have somebody come in and tell you what they think about what you're doing. I think teachers have to continually hone their craft. It's something you have to work on. Today, Barbara will observe Raymond's class and give him advice on how to improve his teaching. Good morning. Hey, Barbara, how are you? How you doing, Raymond? Doing good, doing good. Good to meet you in person. Likewise. When I walk into a classroom, the first thing I look at are how are the desks arranged? Are the desks arranged in a way that students can communicate with each other and talk to each other? That's real important. I look around the walls to see if there's any visuals there. A lot of students will learn just by seeing and looking and seeing and looking. Uh, is there a word wall up there? Are there vocabulary words there for the student? Those are the things I look for first in a mathematics classroom. You don't need calculators, just go have a seat. Take out your homework. All right, first thing I want you to do is always take out your homework, homework calendar, open up your notebooks. There are two problems up on the board. Take a look at them. Two area problems up on the board. We have x, and then x plus 3, and then y, y plus 7. How do we solve this first one? Based on what you learned yesterday, how do you think you would try to solve the first one? And I'll do this for think time. I haven't done this for a little while, so this means I will give you time to think when I go like that. That means I want you to raise your hand. And just because your hand's not raised doesn't mean I might not call on you. Okay? So, Think time. How would you solve this problem? Okay. Terrell, you want to go first? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You probably got to um, like test the number, like put a number in there to test it. So what do you mean by put a number in where this is or yeah, inside? The other one. The other one. Here? So substitute a number in here. Okay. With hands, what's x times x? Think time. x times x. Z. X times x. Lamar, then Shalon. X squared. X squared. Shalon, what do you think? You agree? Okay. So it was X squared, and I asked Y. Okay. Um, Trey? Because you multiplying the variable by itself. Multiplying the variable by itself. Terrell, what do you think about that response? I see that. You agree? So we know X times X is X squared. So if I draw this line here, so if I put X squared in here like that, did I draw it right? Yes or no, and why? 
Look at how I drew that in, in the area diagram. Did I draw that correctly? Why or why not? Why is it called x squared? What, does it make some kind of shape? Does it, does it symbolize some kind of shape? It makes sense. You think so? So is it called x rectangled? x squared, so come on, give me a good guess what kind of shape it's going to represent. It's going to make a square. Did I make a square here, Johnny? No. No, so I didn't draw it accurately. So I should have drawn it more to scale, so I think it's a little better. So that'd be x squared. And we know that someone said 2 times x is 2x, so what is x times 3? We're taking this term, and we're going to multiply it by that term. Um, Shalon, what do you think x times 3 is going to be, the product? Three x. Three x. Right. Why? Because x is multiplied by three. That's right. And it's not three times three times three. That would be x to the third power. It's just three times x. The total area of this, if we combine it, would be we have x squared. This was our first step. Second step for the distributive property is going to be x times three. So the total area, we need to put these terms together. Can I combine these two terms? Hmm. What do you think, Samantha? Can we combine x squared and 3x? Are they alike or unalike? Uh, or unalike, yeah. Unalike. I don't think they're alike. You're right. Good guess. So why don't you think they're alike? I'm not sure. Raymond seems to be a very dedicated teacher. He seems to be really interested in improving his learning. He's open, which is wonderful. He seems to trust that maybe we'll have some good ideas. And I'm hoping that when he does implement ideas, he'll be able to change them, make them his own. So I think it'll be a good relationship. Take your time, use your notes. I'm expecting to go over this in about 15 minutes. All right, let's get started, guys. Yep, six times, it's all multiplying, okay? I'll make that as a multiplication operation. Six times three and six times x. Is it still this? So should that be squared? Should be, yes. So show some calculations for more evidence. I'll help you. You're done too? You do this side, you do that side. Put your hand up if you're already finished. If you're already done. Okay. All right, two things we gotta do before we go down to form. One is we're gonna do our reflections. So, what am I learning, guys? You can use this same objective here. Multiply binomials using an area diagram. The second question is, why am I learning it? That's the part you gotta think a little deeper about. You're gonna finish page three for your homework on that paper that's given out. Anyone knock at the paper, Trey. I want to yeah, I share with you an example of a, a meaningful reflection. It relates to what we learned yesterday, and I can apply it if I wanted to be a carpenter or a designer. So there's an example of a meaningful reflection about what we learned, how did, um, why am I learning it? We're learning it because it builds upon what we learned yesterday, and how could it apply to my life in a career and occupation? I saw most of you if not all of you came today with your A games, working hard, talking about it, okay? Being very focused. That's what, that's what we do on a daily basis. Okay, so give yourselves a round of applause for your effort that you gave yourself. Raymond, thank you very much for letting me come in and watch you today. I got involved in, in watching you a little bit, and I love the idea that you modeled first. I think that's a great idea. After I followed along with you a little bit, when you're modeling, I'm thinking to myself, why do I care about this? I think you had to build something in early on, like, why? Why should I care? I don't know that they know why they're doing this. They really like you, and they're willing to work for you. I would have to guess that they were outstandingly, wonderfully behaved today, because they were a little better behaved than a typical eighth grader on a typical day. Okay. And if they want to work for you, as you know, that's more than half your battle in middle school. I felt that there wasn't enough thinking going on in their case. Okay. They were bored. So that's why I think you have to group more. I would group groups of four, get them used to it. And it has to be group think. It means we have to work together as a group. This is real life. This is what you have to do in real life. How do you think you would try to solve the first one? 
And I'll do this for think time. I haven't done this for a what while. What is that? So. What is think time? That's one of my questions. Oh, it's uh, just giving kids the chance, waiting time, you know, to, to think about the question. Because um, myself, you know, when somebody asks me a question, if you're looking at a problem, and I need some time to think about it. Hopefully. That was a great idea. I needed more time. I love the idea. I thought, I was like, ooh, that, he's got it. Great. I love the idea, but it's not near enough time. Something else I want you to think about, too, is your questions. Try purposely not to make them convergent. When I come next time, I want to see evidence of them thinking in alternate ways. I want you to, between now and then, start to ask questions that are divergent questions. They follow more of Bloom's higher order thinking questions. I want to see the atmosphere shift of, okay, I'm asking a question on, can you get the answer? The answer's black. Now, are you going to say black too? Ooh, good. You're thinking. You've, got, you've thought of something I didn't think of. I would like you to feel comfortable with them telling you something you're not prepared to hear. I also want to see some sort of engagement, whether it's whatever you can you know, feel comfortable with, whether it's groups, games, competition, group think. I want to see something where they feel more responsible as a group, not as an individual, to apply their time to that task and care about the task. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I want to see is I want to make sure they have a feeling, and if you choose the questions carefully, I, that they understand there's a reason to do this. Why do I care? You don't want to be the sage on the stage. Right. You want to be that guide on the side. So you want to be in there asking questions. You want to be a magician that's not going to tell them the answer, but you're going to ask questions. And I say to teachers, when you're about to tell, because time is clicking, you're frustrated, change your telling into a question. You know, I'm going to sit back and reflect on these and, and start building this into my, my lessons, you know, piece by piece. All right, well, All thank right. you very much. It was a pleasure. Raymond now has four weeks to implement Barbara's advice before a final observation. You know, I try things the next day. I put kids in groups of like four or five and turn things into a game, which kind of created that competitiveness. It worked well. There was an um, incentive in the fact that it was a game. They, had, they could earn points. The team at the end with the most points would get uh, some kind of reward, either like a homework pass. It's pretty much a hot commodity in the classroom. The climate of the room changed. You know, it, it was, uh, the period went by pretty quick. And kids recognized that, and that's always a good sign that they, they were on task and working pretty hard. These are things that, since everybody knew, they're kind of like, you know, if, if like this is my toolbox, it's like, it's kind of in the, the bottom of the toolbox, kind of dusty, because I haven't used it in a while. I just haven't um, forgot about it temporarily as a strategy, an effective strategy. So that was, that was good to kind of spread out all the tools and take a look at them and dust them off and, and start using them again. Another thing I still plan to work on is having my questioning skills be to the point where I'm asking more divergent questions to generate students' thoughts and try to come up with alternative strategies to solving a problem. I think that's the purpose with divergent questions. There's more than one way to do this. How else can we do it? So yeah, I need, I need some, some help with that for sure. Raymond is meeting with his mentor, Jerry Weiner, to discuss the feedback he received from Barbara. We've known each other for a long time. We talk once a week at least about school and education. So last week when Barbara came to my class, you know, when we were debriefing after she observed me. Um, she, she, talked, she just came in, watched the class, and took some notes, and then this is afterwards. Yeah, and she walked around the kids, and she actually talked to the kids, which is really good. She said, I'm actually talking too much. You know, have kids come up to the board more. You tend to do that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, divergent questions, she said, you know, go into divergent questions. She was talking about using you know, verbs like summarize, you know. Um, Synthesize. Yeah, and have them convince you, you know, mm -hmm. that this problem is, is right or it's the only way to solve a problem. And right. As a trigger to kind of get kids to say, well, you can also solve it this way, have the kids talk about it. And I kind of step out of the picture and, you know, then it's just stud totally student-driven right. in that sense. One of the things I'm trying to focus on is having talk more in their teams about the work. So we did a little tournament where they had two problems to solve um, as a team. Right. They handed one paper for the whole team, but they ought to be able to explain how they got the answers. They're all accountable for it. it. Right. And that was good. Some kids couldn't answer it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's tough. Right. And, uh, this is getting up there now. Yeah, because this is actually, you know, ninth grade stuff, and I keep telling yeah. them that, and I'm using that as like a motivator.
What I'm looking for in Raymond's classroom is I'm looking for him to be less procedural. I want to see his classroom be more student-centered. I think everything falls out of that if he can stop being as procedural. I want him to ask questions. When the students don't understand something, does he tell them or does he ask a question? What kind of questions does he ask? Does he present a problem where they have time to think about it? Are they going to be in groups? Are they going to be talking to each other? Today, Barbara Vandenberg is back to check on Raymond's progress. Let's go, guys. Calculators, get your calculators, let's go. Uh, book bags on the floor, the chairs over next to you, put on the chair next to you, don't want to see them on your backs. Okay, we're not sharpening pencils right now. Lie now, hey, have a seat for right now, okay? You'll sharpen it in a few seconds. Lie now, just have a seat. If this was the data for one company, this is the data for another company, you want to invest some money, think about which company would you invest your money in, because it's going to tie into what we're doing. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to work in teams of four again. So, this will be a team of four. You guys will be a team of four. We'll make you guys a team of four. Team of four. You have 10 seconds to rotate your desk into your team. Are you ready? Go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Marquise, move your desk around. Lamar. 3. All right, so we have three function tables. First one is a linear function. And the, the, uh, the expression, or the binomial, we can call it that as well. The first column, it says T for time. That is your M for your minutes. So you can also put an M here. It says T, but that's also your minutes. This is your cost. So for example, it goes 0, 1, 2, 3. If you want to do this out, there's going to be m is 0. 0 plus 2, the sum would go in here. OK? Let's get started. Nice job. Tanee is already working. Today, Raymond is challenging his students to calculate and compare the costs of different cell phone plans using function tables and graphs. None of us get it. You guys are stuck? Oh, I thought you said you got it. I'm sorry. All right. So watch. And here's your formula, m plus 2, okay? You're going to do, these are your m values. The t is for time, so these are your m values right here. So you're going to put in the value for m, substitute it in, 0 plus 2 is how much? 2. Go to your next m value. 1 plus 2 is, okay? How are you getting that value? 2 times 2 is 4. But you also add, have to add the other part of the expression in there. Because you, right. You just got to take your time, Tarot. How'd you get eight? It's right here. But what's three squared? Six. Check that on the calculator for me. I mean nine. Why is it nine? I mean, no, yeah, it's nine. <laughs> Convince me that it's nine. Man, this, you, a uh, math teacher, how you, how need to convince you? Convince me it's nine. Whoa. Thank you. So what's three squared? Three times three. Okay. All right, good. So did you graph them yet? So you gotta take these points and graph them on your, on your plot. Piece. Zero, this is your time on the bottom. Your M. This is your cost. Zero and two goes here. I saw a big difference in their behavior between this time and last time. Last time I didn't think behavior was an issue. Today behavior was a very big issue. Terrell, I'm going to have to put you somewhere else. I'll give you one more chance to get it together. Where? Right now you go back, go down to Ms. Rodriguez's room. And then wouldn't you go ahead and use your voice? Yeah. Just have one more chance. Just sit down and prove it to me. Well, then what you want to do is... Okay, so... Convince me, why shouldn't I buy Plan C? I have a better question. Convince me how Plan C would be the best... be in my best interest. All right, think outside the box. If I was not a customer, I was a stockholder in a company, which company would you want to invest in then? Or which company would I would be in my best interest or your best interest and why? 
I think it can be because it's um, like a compromise between you getting a good business and them getting a good price. Korea, can you repeat that for everyone to hear? Jeff, you ready to hear and listen? I said plan B because it's a compromise between the person that buy in and the people with that's on the shop. If these were investments, you were investing in company A, B, or C, or investment plans, which plan would you want to invest in and why? A. Okay, how come? Because it costs less. It costs less? Okay, so let me explain this part. When you invest in things, it means how much they're making how much money they're making. So initially, if you put in, let's say this was $200, uh -huh. your money would grow according to the graphs. The way the lines are represent, that represents your growth in, in your return of money. If let's say plan C was, um, you know, AT&T, where they make a lot of money, but they're having problems with a lot of drop calls, their return on investment might change. All right, we kind of ran short on time. Your homework, if you did not finish, um, the graph in the back is to do that tonight. Some of you did a really nice job this period being focused, being active in the lesson, discussing, sharing your ideas. Terrell. Um, keep in mind, you know, we still have a solid two months of school left. Don't start making poor choices with behavior and being out of uniform and things like that because, first of all, it's going to impact your opportunity to do eighth grade activities. And secondly, on a short-term basis, next week is report card conferences. The good, the bad, the ugly gets discussed at report card conferences, whether in person or on the phone. Center one, push your chairs in, gentlemen line up on the side, ladies up front. Freeman, thank you for allowing us to come into your classroom today. How do you think the class went? It's a little bit of a struggle with motivation today for some reason. There's some good things towards the end of the lesson, the discussion about uh, how I close it out with um, investments, looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, some of the things I thought, reflecting back, that I would have changed was, I think I went too fast for the little modeling of the, the function tables for the kids. I could see the changes you made in the class, the pedagogy which you deliver your lesson. There was a lot of confusion in the beginning. I asked, why aren't you getting started? And they're like, we don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. And you made a nice observation that you noticed they got more involved at the end of the lesson, which is very unusual, as you know, as a teacher. You don't usually grab them at the end of the lesson. Right. At the end of the lesson, they're usually spent. But I think you hit on a very important piece, is when you made it real life and relevant, they came alive. It was very interesting to see that difference. Yeah. I felt that this was going to be a challenging lesson. I want to see how you deal with the challenges, because I expect it to be challenging. And challenging it was indeed. One thing I do want to really compliment you on, you said to watch for your divergent thinking questions. You said that was still challenging for you. You're doing a really good job on that. Convince me, why shouldn't I buy Plan C? When you started to really throw it out to them, I thought your questions were very good. So I would just keep on asking them. I feel that um, what happened perhaps is I gave you a lot of good ideas theoretically. And then today we saw them practically. And when you have 38th grade students, they don't work practically, like putting them in groups and expecting them to work together. So I want to help you with the practicality of that. You have 90 minutes, that's an incredibly long period of time. I'm sure today it felt like an eternity. But what you want to do is chunk it. They're not good enough to really just go off on their own and be motivated and care and do the work. So we want to chunk it. Now that we put them into groups, now we have a whole new problem. Now we have group dynamics that we have to work on. They like you, they're willing to work for you, but now maybe they're liking you a little too much. I think I think you're going to have to teach them a lot of things that are non-mathematical. I could clearly see that today. And that's our job. Our job is not just math. I would suggest being a little military with them. So I'd have them, okay, get up, stand, turn, address the classroom, and speak. But I think you have to be a lot tougher with these kids because they're walking all over you. It's good because you have no buttons. You know, they're, they're always looking for that button to send you off. And the right. two times I've observed you, you're very calm. You don't, have, you don't react, which is great. So let's look at our measure sheet that we had, um, group dynamics. Were all students engaged? No. no. They were engaged, but not all. Right. Were they sharing strategies? Well, some were, some were right. and some were. It was clear. It was a clear division line. Do they see the relevance of learning this topic? I think that's your responsibility. I don't think they did, and I think that was pretty easy to do, as you saw at the end. So mm -hmm. I think you're going to have to front load that your lessons with that. Right. Your questioning. I thought that was the, your, I thought that was strong. I really liked that. You did convince me. You were less procedural. You threw the questions out there. You didn't answer them either. You didn't so, so often. Teachers will throw the questions out and then answer them. 
But I thought you did a good job, and I would just say keep on keeping on on that. I thought that was good. But I'd like to see your cadence in the questioning. Question. You had it at the end. At the end, I don't know if you felt it at the end, but the yeah. end, the summary, like it all came together. They quieted down. Mm -hmm. They started listening. And you're doing the teaching of this group, but you're doing the teaching through questioning, not through telling, just like you did at the end. I mean, I know you know how to do it because you did a beautiful job of it. And I, you're, you would probably blame me and say, well, you said put them in groups. That it was unmanageable. It was unmanageable to see who was learning, who wasn't learning, who was on task, who wasn't on task. That has to break down into smaller groupings. Does it take time? Does it take energy? Does it take planning? Absolutely, yeah. but you know what? It makes your life so much better. You can go home I at the agree. end of the day, and you know it's so much nicer. That's all I have to say. But you did a nice job implementing these things that we did. Mm -hmm. I liked the whole idea. Of the to me, questioning is one of the most challenging aspects to get a person to change. And I like that you uh, believed and trusted and tried it. And it's it. I think it's working for you, and it's going to get better and better and better over time. When I looked, we came the first time. I didn't see behavior as a problem. They seemed to be working and motivated. And today, they didn't seem to be motivated. They didn't seem to care about the topic. Which is more like the real class? Have they been, how have they been since September? Uh, kind of a combination of both. You know, as a group that's kind of hit and miss. You know, it's, it's a, there's kids in there who, um, phone calls with parents, you know, suspensions, you know, things that I've gone through the progressive discipline hasn't really worked. It's always a struggle. Do you think you're going to be able to impact change this year or end of April? Do you think you're going to be able to make any change in that this year with them? Yeah, I can't afford not to because the alternative is, you know, it's going to get even harder to, to get them and, and do my job. And, you know, the kids who, who come there every day prepared, their, their time's going to be wasted and they're going to have a poor taste in their mouth about math because it's a math subject and just want to get it done with. And, it's, you know, that's not what education is about. Thank you.